We're live for the first time since the beginning of March. We are actually able to worship with you. Um, and I'm super excited for this opportunity. In fact, I've told everybody here, I'm actually a little nervous. I have butterflies in my stomach. I'm hoping that the technology um, is all cooperating and that in this time, we are able to forget about the fact that we are separated by space and be reminded that we are united by the Spirit. Today and for the next three weeks, we are going to be looking at the Lord's Prayer and doing a series where we look at each of the different parts of it and why that simple prayer has such a profound meaning on us and how praying it creates that connection that can unify us as God's people. And so now, during this time of worship, I invite you to step from the ordinary into the extraordinary as we worship God together. Let us pray. Abba, Father, Creator, God of love, you open your arms to your children and love to hear us call your name. As we worship, may we feel your nearness, hear your voice, and allow your spirit to lead us on right paths for your name's sake. Give us words that honor and build up to your glory and that of your Son, Jesus, who taught us how to pray. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, our series that we'll be looking at for the next few weeks is 
the Lord's Prayer, and we'll be looking at the version of the Lord's Prayer that we find in Luke primarily. We will look at it other um, the Mark version as well today. So you will become very familiar with these words that I'm sure you have memorized in your heart since you were young, but I invite you to hear them again. Luke 11, verses 1 through 4. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to a time of trial. The word of God for the people of God. So there was a a book that was written several years ago. The book is called Inner Peace and the author is Ron Sebring. And he says in this book, in his book, that there is a difference between those who pray and those who don't. He says, those who pray, who don't pray, that those people that don't pray, they are tossed about by events, like pieces of debris carried along by ocean currents. But people that do pray are connected consciously to God and to God's will for their lives and can navigate these currents of life better. Now, I love to kayak. It's one of the things that we enjoy doing when the weather is nice. And if you have ever been in a kayak or canoe on a steady flowing river, you know how important it is to navigate away from the debris that is there. We use the oars and our paddles to help us stay where we need to stay in those ocean currents. And on more than one occasion, I have been distracted or unprepared, and I have found myself headed towards the giant downed tree on the side of the river, and my boat has been threatened to tip over. And I promise you that in those moments, I was praying as I was being dragged through the branches, and I feared for my safety. But that's not the only time that we should pray, uh, pray, of course. We need prayer in our lives all the time. And sometimes the prayer is very simple. Sometimes the prayer is only, Lord, help me, help me, help me. That was my prayer that day on the river on more than one occasion when I have found myself dragged down someplace I don't want to be. The other time our prayer, and the one we pray probably should pray the most often, is simply, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. God knows what currents are pushing and pulling us. And we could pray only those two simple prayers of help me, help me, help me, or thank you, thank you, thank you. But sometimes when we pray, we don't even have those words. Our prayer is simply opening ourselves to God and inviting our creator to simply hear the sound of our soul. Other times, we strive to find just the right words to capture all that we are thinking and feeling. And in those moments, there's there's just great comfort in knowing what to say. So the scripture today says when Jesus was in that certain place with his disciples... That is what the disciples needed. That is what they asked for. They needed their rabbi to give them something to rely on when they were uncertain or overwhelmed or the currents of their lives were pushing and pulling them to and fro. And so they said, teach us to pray. That's what one of the disciples said. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And so he did. The NRSV translation that I read of Luke's gospel, Jesus told them to begin by calling upon God in a way that was very, very personal. He said, when you pray, say, Father. 
It's important to, though, I think, step back for a second and acknowledge that not every earthly father was or is a good parent. Some of us didn't know our fathers or knew them too little or suffered because of their words or actions. And others were blessed with fathers who were caring and compassionate. Because not every experience of earthly parenthood is the same, we need to be clear that when we envision God as a parent, God is the ideal father or mother. God, our Father, wants the best for us. But also, like every good parent, has high expectations of their offspring. And then also wants us to live into our full potential while thriving in healthy and loving relationships. As children of God, we are invited to address our Creator as a loving parent. Now, for our Jewish brothers and sisters, God's true name could not be spoken because it was so sacred, so very holy. Now, this in our world, this idea of sacred is kind of hard to understand, that a word could be sacred, that a word could be holy. We have all these acronyms that we use. We don't even use words anymore half the time. It's like OMG, right? We don't even, can't even say the three words. Or emojis. We have these little smiley faces and frowny faces that are used to express words. And our language has lost its sense of sacredness. So what, then, does it mean if we say that God's name is holy? If God's name is holy, perhaps it has less to do with what we say or how we say it and more to do with how we hold those words and those names and those beings within us. What we call God should mean something to us. The name that we give God, it indicates who we understand God to be in our lives and in that moment. When we pray, those very first words that are on our lips indicate how we relate to God and the location within our worldview where we envision God. For example, if I pray to my Father in heaven... Now, it may be years of habit. That may be how we have always re referred to God. Or it may express my need to understand God as a parent who oversees the world like a loving father. Or if I pray to my creator, I could express my need to understand God as still creating and touching the world. See, to pray, it's an invitation to behold the God who creates with awe and wonderment. It is to engage with God in a way that is holy. And to pray is to look outside of ourselves and this world that we can see and allow ourselves to be drawn into this realms of creation that we cannot see. When we pray, we experience the spiritual and the mystical and the holy. I think that that's probably why things like yoga and tai chi and meditation and some of these other practices have become so very popular lately. We long for the holy. We long to create these spaces and these occasions where we can experience the divine because we need the holy. We are wired to search for meaning and purpose. But more than that, we are wired to do it together. We are wired to search for meaning in community. I mean, when we look at the prayer that we pray, Jesus' prayer reminds us that we share one parent. Now, if we look at the Matthew version, which is, of course, different than the Luke version, Matthew's version of the Lord's prayer, he says, Our Father. Not 
dear father, or even just father like Luke did. In Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, he says, our father. That's how we normally begin our prayer here on Sunday mornings when we worship together. We begin with saying, our It's this idea of community, of family, that it is God does not belong to one person, but that God belongs to all of us, that you and me and our neighbors and all people, we share this same divine parent. So the person that makes us laugh and the person that makes us want to scream and the person who delights us with their gifts And the person whose perspectives and opinions are the opposite of our our own, all of these are our divine siblings. If we could live our lives seeing all people as holy siblings, imagine how much better life could be. That would truly be God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. Imagine a world where we worked to live together peacefully with our brothers and our sisters. This power of togetherness is amazing. I mean, if you are ever going to go down a river on a kayak or canoe, you should never do it alone. You need people to help load and unload the boats. You need someone along in case your boat tips over or you become entangled in these branches. And not only that, it's a lot more fun to kayak down a river with somebody else, where you get to share the experience of traveling that river together, where you get to point out the wildlife and the natural beauty all around and marvel at it together. We are better. We are stronger when we do things together, when we think together, when we feel together, and when we pray together. We are building God's kingdom when we we remember that God is not my God alone, but God is our God, our creator, our father. This church The idea of church itself, it is meant to be a place where we can live life into the kingdom of God, where we build a community of God's children. Now, being a community certainly looks different this year than it did a year ago. I think we can all agree. But we're still knit together. We are still the church. We still care for one another and support each other, even if we have to do it from afar. And we still pray to God, our parent, our creator, our mother, our father. It is a personal and real connection that all of us have to God, not just as individuals, but as the whole world. So Jesus said, when you pray, begin by acknowledging that God is holy It is as intimately known as a parent. Jesus invites us in this prayer to pray to God like we are speaking to a parent who loves us. Our Father. In that prayer, there is an invitation to hold God inside your spiritual self and to call upon God to walk with you on this journey that we share, a prayer to a loving parent that unites us as divine siblings. In that book I mentioned earlier, Inner Peace, the author Ron Sebring, he dives into the Lord's Prayer and he notes two really important things about the tone of how it was written. He says two things, it is imperative and it is authoritative. It says, believe me and do it now. And that's in line with the entire book of Luke, if you read through it. He writes with authority, and there is this sense of urgency. And Luke, in his gospel, much of it includes glimpses of hope that one day the oppressed will be set free. 
And one step toward true freedom is to see each other as divine siblings, as Jesus taught us. If that is our prayer, let us pray the Lord's Prayer not out of habit, but as if those words behold God who creates with awe and wonderment. The Lord's Prayer is uncomplicated and it's ancient, yet it is a powerful invitation to stand before the holy and address the sacred personally. Our Father. We pray and we are connected consciously to God and God's will for our lives in a way that can navigate these currents of life better. We pray and God hears us. It is so simple and yet it is enough. Will you pray with me? Father, Abba, loving parent, nurturing mother, holy one, thank you, thank you, thank you. God, you love us and all that you have made. And as you care for us, you call us to care for all of your creatures of every size and variety, teaching them as, treating them as you would. We thank you for all the blessings in our lives, for healing, for compassion, for love, for the air that fills our lungs and the sun that brings life. Forgive us, O oh God, when we use your name in less than honorable ways, when we do not treat it as holy. May our words respect the one who made us. We pray for the church for the world and all those in need. We pray for those who feel alone, forsaken, or unable to call on you. We bring before you the sick and the suffering, knowing you are quick to heal and ever willing to listen. Help us. Help us. Help us. Join us in solidarity with those around the world who call on you. Unite us in love and in your mission to spread the good news of the gospel. Hold your children in perpetual love and light, O oh God. And bring us all to the day when we will be one in you. We pray and you hear us. It is so simple and it is enough. Amen. God is always with us, not just when everything seems clear and times are good, but also when we struggle with questions and doubt. When we cry out to God, our prayers are heard. When the world cries out to God, we are part of God's answer, offering water in the desert, offering nourishment to a world that is spiritually hungry. Our gifts are our answer to God's own goodness. Today and every day, let us offer our gifts to God in gratitude and praise.
Let us pray. Holy One, Lord, we honor you with the abundance of our lives and care for the needs of others as you would care for them. Bless these gifts that they may be used for the benefit of all. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father, not my Father. In a world that can be so focused on me, my, and mine, the prayer Jesus taught us reminds us that we are a community. The communion table is where we can join together with our God as one community all of us gather into one sacred space where we experience forgiveness, love, and grace. We, all <clears throat> we are all beloved, all worthy, all welcome. We are a community not defined by a building, a city, a state, or a country, we are a community of God, our God. Come to the table, Jesus says. You are welcome and you belong to me. Eat and drink and know the love of God that has, God has for you. This is the table of our parent, our father. And the best meals are always the ones where you linger around the table afterwards, where the dirty dishes sit untouched and the conversation flows. The kind of meals where you sit and you argue and you laugh and maybe even cry. This is the sort of meal that we're invited to join in. This is the table that is set for us to come and to feel welcome. As we gather, we remember a meal that Jesus had with his friends. That night, he took bread and broke it and gave it to them, and he said, eat from it, all of you. This bread, let it be a reminder of my humanity, of my body. Then Jesus took a cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them, and he said, drink from it, all of you. I will not drink it again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of heaven. This is the bread of life, and this is the cup of hope. You are invited to come and enjoy a meal with your Father. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, your invitation to come and feast in your presence is but a taste of the love you extended to us every day. <clears throat> By your very nature, you're always seeking us out, searching for ways to connect us and to connect with us. You meet us in the most ordinary of places, and you make them sacred. By your grace, we come to recognize the holiness that dwells in the world around us, in our neighbors, in our internal depths. In collective longing for the taste of your kingdom on earth, we join together in echoing the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And so now, wherever you are, I invite you to take the bread, to eat, and to remember. And now the cup. Drink and remember. Thanks be to God. So glad that we have had a chance to be together virtually for this time of worship. It is uncertain when we will once again sit in these pews, but it is such a blessing to know that as divine siblings, we are united by our divine parent. Continue to pray. Pray this simple prayer that we have embedded in our hearts since we were little ones. Or pray simply, help me, help me, help me. Or thank you, thank you, thank you. Or open your heart and use no words, but invite God in. So let us now receive the blessing. Holy One, we gather to worship, to offer our praise. And now we leave this sacred time to go into the world to serve. We pray that you will guide us, that your holy light will lead us, and that everything we do will be done to build your kingdom here on earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a blessed week.